All right. Good evening, people in person and people online. <laughs> uh, and welcome. My name is Mark Mamagoni, and I'm the Director of Academic Affairs at Nasser. And uh, I want to first of all acknowledge and thank the co-sponsors of this evening's program, uh, the Society for Armenian Studies, SAS, and the Mashtos Chair in Armenian Studies at Harvard University. Uh, thank you for your co-sponsorship. And, and since one individual, Christina Maranzi, is both the president of the Society for Armenian Studies and the holder of the Mashtots chair, I wish to thank her, even though she is traveling today and unable to be with us tonight. SAS and the Mashtots chair are two of our frequent collaborators, and we greatly appreciate the ongoing partnership with them. Uh, I would like to remind all in attendance, either in person or online, and perhaps in this case especially online, uh, that Nasser and SAS depend on your contributions and membership dues to carry out our work in support of Armenian studies. And I also want to mention that in September of this year, Nasser and the Mashtos Chair will be co-hosting the SAS 50th Anniversary Conference details forthcoming. So if you care about the work that these organizations are doing, and, and I hope you do, and you should, please get involved and please give your support. I'm not going to announce all of our upcoming events, but I will refer you to our website, nasser.org, or follow us on social media to be aware of all the many, many programs going on here in greater Boston and around the country. Uh, I have one other small bit of business before introducing our speaker. Um, our cherished friend and NASA colleague, Lori Ardumian, successfully ran the Boston Marathon two days ago. <laughs> and in so doing, uh, she raised an impressive amount of money for, the research, for research on and awareness of liver cancer. It was her first time running a marathon of any kind, and possibly the last. I'm not sure she is as it is. And it is a truly awesome accomplishment. And thank you for applauding. But pl applaud again, please. And those of you at home, please applaud all set. OK, is that, is that good, Laura? Thank you. OK, all right. All right, moving right along. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Bedros Dermatosia. This is not Bedros's first time speaking at Nasser, indeed not by a long shot. Rather, his first talk at Nasser was in 2007 when he was a small child, no, when he was a PhD candidate at Columbia University. In the 17 years since then, Bedros has become one of the leading and most active figures in the field of Armenian studies, to say nothing of the adjacent fields of Ottoman and Middle Eastern studies. He has given many talks and participated in many panels for Nasser, but it is his first time speaking here in person in many years, actually. Uh, Bedros Dermatosian is Professor of Modern Middle East History and the Hyman Rosenberg Professor in Judaic Studies at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, where he has taught since 2010. Born and raised in Jerusalem, he is a graduate of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and he completed his Ph.D. in Middle East History at Columbia University in 2008. From 2008 to 2010, he was lecturer of Middle East history at MIT. He has also served as the Dumanian visiting professor at the history uh, at the University of Chicago. Just last week, the University of Nebraska announced that Bedros is a recipient of the College Outstanding Research and Creativity Award in recognition of his significant research accomplishments in the past five years. And it is typical that I did not learn this from Bedros because he's very modest, but rather my wife saw it on Facebook. So uh, that, that tells you a lot as well. Bedros is the author of Shattered Dreams of Revolution, From Liberty to Violence in the Late Ottoman Empire, Stanford University Press 2014, which was the winner of the 2015 Dr. Sona Aronian Book Prize for Excellence in Armenian Studies given by Nasser and the Society for Armenian Studies Outstanding Book Award. And he's also the author of The Horrors of Adana, Revolution and Violence in the Early 20th Century, Stanford University Press 2022. He's the editor of the volumes The First Republic of Armenia on its centenary, Politics, Gender, and Diplomacy, 
Fresno, 2020, and Denial of Genocides in the 21st Century, University of Nebraska, 2023, and co-editor of several important books and a, the author of a long list of articles and book chapters of note. He is also the series editor of Armenians in the Modern in the Modern and Early Modern World, published by I.B. Taurus and Bloomsbury Press, which has rapidly become a vital and important outlet for uh, significant scholarly works in our field. <laughs> Bedros is the most recent past president of the Society for Armenian Studies, and he serves on the boards of various international educational institutions and the editorial board of multiple journals, including the International Journal of Middle East Studies, IJMAS. He is a past member of the Nasser Board of Directors and a long-serving member of Nasser's Academic Advisory Committee. He gets angry when I say this, but I am truly proud of all he has accomplished and continues to accomplish. He will speak tonight about a new volume of which he is the editor, the Armenian Social Democrat Hunchakian Party, Politics, Ideology, and Transnational History, published by I.B. Taurus in, in the series of which he is the editor. This is a welcome and much-needed book uh, which focuses on the still terribly understudied Unchakian party that played such an important role after its formation in the late 19th century, as we will hear. I am sorry and disappointed to say that our shipment of the book failed to arrive in time for tonight's talk, but it is coming, and I will direct you to Lori Ardumian, the marathoner, who will take your contact information for anyone who signs up tonight, either in person or online, we will sell it for the uh, intended uh, lecture sale price of 25% off of the list. So please get in touch with Laura at laura at nasser.org or see her in the room. Likewise, uh, yes, that will apply for, for everyone tonight. Fair? <clears throat> okay. So now finally, please welcome our speaker, Bedros Dermatos. Okay. That was a long introduction, but he deserves it. Thank you, Mark, for this unending un un uh, infinite introduction. Thank you. You're very kind. So uh, today I'm going to introduce the book that I edited uh, last year, came out uh, Last year, actually, 2023, I two books came out. One of them was Denied of Genocides in 21st Century, and the second one is this, uh, The Armenian Social Democrat and Chakian Party, Politics, Ideology, and Transnational History. Uh, just to give you some background about the book, uh, half of the articles in the book were the result of a conference that was organized by the Social Democrat and Chakian Party in uh, Los Angeles, and the other half are uh, contributors whom I mobilized, recruited to contribute to the uh, edited volume. And of course, if you have multiple contributions, then the task of the editor is to come up a way to make sense, divide the book accordingly, and make sense of the book. And, uh, the title of the book is Armenian Social Democrat and Chakian Party. Of course, the uh, Social Democrat and Chakian Party never put Armenian uh, at the beginning, but the reason is for publication purposes. Some people think that I um, did a mistake by putting Armenian in there, but from publishing point of view, you can't just put their social democrat and Chakian party because in general audience or within the academic field, no one knows what means social democrat and Chakian party. We have to put the name Armenian there in order to make sense of what's happened. So this is the book, the cover of the book, and this is a design that we have for the series Armenians in the early and early modern world. The series is going well. We have about six books now published. Four are on the way. In total would be 10, hopefully, by the end of the year. And we have other uh, six and seven in the pipeline. So the, the series is getting richer and richer day by day. So I'll start with this picture. This is a picture of an Armenian Fedayi and Chakian member in Marash. His name is Kevork Chekmayan, and he is my grandmother's brother. Kevork Chekmayan was a fighter in the Social Democrat and Chakian Party, defending Marash from 
the massacres that befell on Marash in 1920. So this, this is an important uh, point which indicates that uh, I grew up with this heirloom in the family. The picture was there and I never thought that one day I was going to edit a book that deals with what my great uncle was involved in. And as a matter of fact, most Cilicians were mostly belonged, politically belonged to Social Democrat and Chakya Party because Cilicia was under the influence of the Hinchaks, then the Dashnaks, the Dashnaks came later. Dashnaks were more uh, more uh, influential in areas such as Sivas, in uh, Van, and many other places, but not in the Cilician area. So I'm just going to pro provide historical background before starting to analyze the book and its contribution. So as any other revolutionary group in the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the, or the mid 19th century, the Social Democratic and Chadian Party was influenced by regional as well as global ideological currents and revolutionary movements. Any revolutionary movement in the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the, or the beginning of the 20th century cannot and should not be analyzed in a vacuum. At the end of the day, these revolutionary groups were influenced by either European ideological revolutionary currents or Russian revolutionary currents. And to that extent, the uh, Hunchaks were influenced by Russian political thought and Russian revolutionary movement. And they had similar objective, like many other Armenian political parties, such as the uh, Armenian Revolutionary Federation, the Armenian uh, Armenagan uh, organization, aimed to improve the condition of the Armenians of the eastern provinces, specifically at the end of the 19th century, from depredation, insecurity, land grabs, etc. So eventually, with the fact that the Hunchaks had the model of reforming the Armenian condition, situation of Armenians, what began in eastern Armenia, but then they concentrated on western Armenia as being the laboratory in which they were going to, stab, uh, to uh, uh, implement their plans. But none of the Hunchaks at the beginning, the leadership, none of them had set foot in eastern Anatolia or western Armenia. So they were motivated by theoretical approaches and they thought that they could change the situation on ground depending on the uh, exigencies, local exigencies. So the Hunchaks, the Social Democratic Hunchakian Party was not born in a vacuum, but was a continuation of the revolutionary movements that emerged. So there are two phases of revolutionary war movements. One of them starts in the 18. 87, 80, 88, 89, and the other one were the previous revolution movements, such as Bashpan Hayren Yats and other patriotic movements that emerged in Vaughan and other places who had similar view, but they were minor groups and did not get the wave in terms of becoming a large political uh, revolutionary group. The young Armenian activists who were residing in St. Petersburg, Russia, or Tiflis, they were influenced by Russian revolutionary organizations such as Zemlya Volia, Land and Freedom, or Narodnya Volia, People's Will. And these are not the, only the Hunchaks, the Dashnaks members were also influenced by Russian political thought, anti tsarist regime, anti tsarist movement, and they were involved actually because they believed that the, the Russian cause is also an Armenian cause, getting rid of the, uh, of the uh, tsar and or dictatorship. Many of the Armenian students of Moscow and St. Petersburg became the major leaders of Armenian revolution movement. The students who studied in St. Lazar, uh, the, in uh, the Lazarov Jemaran, in the in uh, Gevorkian Jemaran, and many other places were really influenced and read many of the theoretical works that were written by Russian intellectuals and were influenced and believed that they could really embrace the cause and transfer it to the different country, which is the Western Armenia. They were imbued with socialist ideologies, which they, with the, which they expressed in their publications. And eventually, the anti-Armenian policies after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II shifted 
the Russian policies towards Armenians. And there we began to see an anti-Armenian policy, which, as a matter of fact, strengthened Armenian ethnic boundaries and radicalized the intellectual movement leading to the emergence of multiple groups. So we have to understand the place and the context in which these groups were born because they weren't born in a vacuum. They were influenced by the political systems, whether it's in Iran, Russia, Ottoman Empire, or Europe, and that those currents and, and waves, or ideological waves, influenced them. Of course, just the basic background, the roots of the Armenian Armenagan organization, you'll start with the Armenagan organization, because eventually after the Armenagan organization, the Social Democrat and Chakian Party is going to emerge. Roots goes back to Mgurjit Portukulian, Portukalian, as you know. He was deported from Van to Marseille, where he be began to publish the Armenian, the newspaper Armenia. Avedis Nazarbegian, who was from Iran, born in Tabriz, he was he came from a very well-to-do family, and he was one of the most important founders of the Hunchakian Party, residing in Marseille. He began to contribute frequently to Armenia and established close contacts with Russian socialist Georgi Plakhnov. And Georgi Plakhnov played an important role in Russian socialism and also had close contacts with the Emancipation of Labor Group of Russia in 1883. And he, meaning Begian, ended up translating works of Plakhnov, Karl Marx, and Frederick Engels to Armenian from Russian or other languages. So here you have theoreticians, Armenian political theoreticians, who are well aware about Marxism through Russia, actually, or through European different points of view regarding the uh, new uh, raging uh, ideological currents that existed at the time. And all of you know that Marx was not also uh, functioning in a vacuum. His Communist Manifesto and other books were the answer to the industrial rea reacting towards the uh, calamities that befell those societies as a result of the Industrial Revolution. His fiancé, Avedis Nazarbegian's fiancé, Maro Vartanian, was also a member of secret Russian revolutionary group, and she had to escape Russia and came to Marseille to be with his fiancé uh, in, uh, in, in, came to Geneva, actually, to be with uh, Avedis Nazarbegian. So they met four other Russian students from Armenia, Rupen Khanazad, Gabriel Kafian, Nikolai Matinian, Magardich Manucharyan, with whom they formed eventually the Hunchakian Revolutionary Party. And this is Im important to understand that these are students who are studying in different European universities and are well-read in revolutionary literature, theoretical literature, they're not just activists carrying the baton and running. They are sophisticated intellectuals whose aim to better the condition of Armenians in a place that they haven't visited even. So the seven official founders eventually became Nazarbegian, Vartanian, Rupen Khanazad, Gevor Karajan, Kristapur Ohanian, Gabriel Kafian, and Levon Stapanian. They decided to publish their own paper called Hinchak, after Alexander Herzen's Kolokol, Alexander Herzen was another Russian important uh, intellectual, or some call him father of uh, Marxism, so Russian Marxism. And their program, actually, the, the Henschak's program, was influenced by both Marxism and Russian populism. It discussed the necessity of tackling the worsening situation of the Armenians through revolution and establishment of a new order based on economic truth, socialist justice, equality, and freedom. So they were heavily influenced by both Russian populism and Marxism. This is Avedis Nazarbegian, just a picture of the most important figure in the Hinchak party. And this is the important picture. As a matter of fact, I mentioned Levon Stepanian, but the founders are Gevork Arajan, Christopher Ohanian, Avedis uh, Nazarbegian, and Maro Vartanian, Gabriel Kafian, and Rupen Khanazad. For example, we have Rupen Khanazad, who's sitting here, was the one on the was lying on the floor. Rupen Khanazad is a major important figure. His memoirs have never been translated. His memoirs have been published in different issues of the Hyrenik Amsakir in Armenian. This is the Hunchak newspaper. 
of course, became the mouthpiece of the Hinchakian party. Issues of the newspaper were smuggled into the Ottoman Empire, as well as uh, the same as many other newspapers, including those of the Young Turks and all other groups who were revolutionary groups wanted to make change, bring change into the Ottoman Empire. So the two major objectives of the Hunchak program were the independence of Turkish Armenia and the establishment of a socialist order, which them, which made them unique among political parties. We don't see any such party that is firmly dedicated to the spread of socialism. But again, as we're going to see, both socialism and nationalism are contradictory, contradictory ideologies. Because to be a dedicated socialist, you have to believe in transcending boundaries and nations because the aim of socialism is to create an equal society a la Marxist style, end of uh, bourgeoisie or proletariat, create an equal society. But how can you become a nationalist party and have socialism your more very important doctrine? And so we have a contradiction, paradoxes that existed within the Nchakyan party. The program of the Nchakyan Revolution Party was both socialistic and nationalistic. Two contradictory items that did not make sense, do, do not make sense this today, but made sense at the time. It became evident that the federation was controlled by so eventually, as all of us know, at the in the 1890s, the old revolutionary groups, when the uh, Armenian Revolutionary Federation was at the beginning of establishment, they called all the groups to come together and form what became to be known as the Federation of Armenian Revolutionary Parties, FAR. All right? FAR. And the, they invited also the Hunchaks who agreed at the beginning, but they had one condition that if we are going to join FAR, we have to, you have to, promise us that socialism should be an important aspect of our new organization. But it became evident that the federation was controlled by an anti-socialist and anti-Nazarbegian group. And this became the reason that the Hinchagian Revolution Party severed its ties with the Federation of Armenian Revolution. And eventually the federation far is going to become the ARF. So one important thing is that Nazarbegian was adamant about not giving up socialism and Marxism as an important doctrine of the organization, whereas the Federation of Armenian Revolutionary Parties believed in that we should tone down about socialism and work towards nationalistic nationalism as an important doctrine. And you have Rupen Khanazad, for example, that figure, who is mediating between the two sides, trying to make a case that, you know, two figures from Christopher Mikhailian and and uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 Christopher Mikhailian and Simon not Simon Zavarian yes Simon Zavarian actually are working with us uh, to no. bring socialism in one way or another but then the third Rostom is against it etc so there are interesting intricacies that's going on within the party if you read the history and the ideology. From the perspective of Hunchak, socialism was not confined to the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire. This is extremely important because the, from the Hunchak, yet again, the paradox. They believe that socialism is an ideology that should be implemented not only on Armenians, but on all other ethnic groups, be them Muslim, Turks, Georgian, etc. So their view of an Armenia that they were going to establish in Western Armenia, whatever you want to call it, Anatolia, Eastern Anatolia, was going to be Armenia. But the doctrine was going to be based on socialism where everyone within that entity was going to be equal regardless of religion, faith, or status. But eventually a rift occurred within the Nchakyan party, which became a major factor in weakening party. It was an internal rift. The main cause of this rift were disagreements on socialism and over the tactics, tactics pursued by the, by the party. The tactics, the Hunchaks believe that it is through mass demonstrations we can bring European attention to the plight of the Armenians and eventually maybe leading to humanitarian intervention, something that I discussed yesterday, analyze what humanitarian intervention is and what entails humanitarian inter intervention. 
But others said that it is not working anymore. Europeans are not going to come. A different group within the Hunchuk said that it seems that European powers are disregarding our plight because we are emphasizing a lot socialism. So we have to get rid of socialism and emphasize on nationalism. And that be became a major component of the rift that occurred within the Nchakian party, led to the emergence of pro-Nazarbegian and anti-Nazarbegian factions. So eventually, in 1898, the anti-Nazarbegian faction met in Egypt and formed a new party called the Reformed Nchakian Party, Vera Gazmial Nchakian. Members of both parties ended up assassinating each other in places like London and many other European countries. As you know, RPR Arpiarian, a famous uh, Armenian writer, was assassinated also in this. He was in Hunchakian and was assassinated by another group. So you have this rift that's not only ideological, it also becomes violent rift, killing each other at the, uh, at the expense of their cause. In terms of activities, all of you know that the, uh, uh, the activities were based on demonstration, mass demonstration, Kum Kapu in uh, 1890. Another important event included the placards incident in Anatolia, and we're going to talk about that. And then the Sassoon Rebellion of August 1894 against nomadic Kurdish tribes and the government tax collectors. Then the Zaytun Rebellion in 1895. The Hinchak considered the Sassoon Rebellion a great triumph that brought European attention to the Armenian question. They argue it resulted in the 11th May 1895 reform memorandum sent by Great Britain, Russia, and France to Sultan Abdul Hamid II. So Armenians at the time had high hopes from European countries that it is the Europeans who are going to save us. Unfortunately, that still remains, uh, I still remain suspicious about that. And uh, and uh, the uh, and they believe that you know if we push more, Europeans might really push the Ottoman Empire in order to improve the lot of the Armenians in the eastern provinces. But all of us know that the 1895 memorandum ended up to be an ink on a paper. Of course, 1908 revolution becomes a major event in changing dynamics of power inside the Ottoman Empire. I'm not going to go into detail. I wrote a book about that. And uh, eventually, in uh, the Young Turks, the Hunchaks were extremely cautious about, their any, about a having any contacts with the Young Turks. Even before the 1908 revolution, when the Young Turks did meet a few times with the leaders of the Hunchak, Sabah Gulyan and many others in Paris and other places, saying, trying to come into an agreement, uh, telling them, you have to give up on European intervention. We work together to get rid of Abdul Hamid II. But they were very critical and they're very cautious and suspicious about the aims of the Young Turks. So they never participated in any of the two major congresses, 1902 and 1907. But the Vera Gazmian Hunchakian party uh, where, where they were convinced by the ARF to come into terms and come and join the Young Turks in uh, trying to, uh, Young Turks in their two congresses, the opposition movements against the uh, Abdul Hamid. And eventually, 1908 revolution takes place. And all of you know, revolution is a major event. Uh, 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 feelings of euphoria and the beginning of new era, equality, fraternity, liberty, but everything becomes uh, uh, collapses eventually when they realize that there is a major difference of political view about what should happen after 1908 revolution. The view was between um, the majority minority or between decentralization, centralization, or between different understanding of what Ottoman citizenship should look like or what our understanding of Ottoman citizenship should look like. So eventually, with the Balkan Wars, where the Armenian question was came to again into the international arena, Armenians thought that with the Balkan Wars, once, once more we can push the Ottomans to reform the condition of the eastern provinces. During this period, when the coup d'etat takes place by the young Turks, killing and assassinating few government members and during their meeting, and they hijack the government, and from there on, it becomes a dictatorial country, uh, empire. In 1913, in its seventh congress, held in Kostanta in Romania, 
the Social Democratic Kanchakian Party decided to engage only in illegal activity because after 1908, they issued a statement saying we are now going to be legal political party working in a legal framework within the Ottoman Empire in order to achieve the goals of the Armenians. But in 1913, they changed to engage only in illegal activity per its principles and hence fight a partisan war until more suitable political and economic conditions prevail. The Congress decided to fight the CUP in an attempt to completely, and I quote, completely crush and top, top, topple it. They were members were arrested in Istanbul in 1914, thanks to an Armenian uh, spy by the name of Artur Yasyan. He gave all the names of the uh, Hunchuk members. And on May 27, 22 members of the Hunchuks, the leading intellectuals, were condemned to death. 22 of them in absentia, Sabah Gulyan, Stepan Sabah Gulyan, came to the United States afterward, and Barastad Hagop Turabian, they were sentenced in absentia. And in June 1915, in June 15, 1915, the other 20 were hanged in the Sultan Bayezid Square of Constantinople, including major leaders such as Paramaz, Murat of Bitlis, Arama Chikpashian, and Dr. Benne Torosian. One thing that people don't, in the Ottoman or Turkish historiography don't, they don't realize is that the Hunchaks were working with the opposition, Ottoman opposition. Their aim was not to bring down the Ottoman Empire. It's, their aim was to assassinate, actually. That's what, that was the plan, to assassinate leaders of the CUP in order to bring back the Ottoman opposition to power. So that's something that is not discussed in detail, and there are few articles in this volume that discuss this issue. So what is the volume about? It's the first academic edited volume in English that assesses the history of the Social Democratic and Chagian Party puts the volume in a global, regional, and local context, brings together senior as well as junior scholars to analyze the different facets of the Social Democratic and Chakian Party, situates the history of the Social Democratic and Chakian Party in the histories of the Ottoman, Russian, and Persian empires, situates the ideological metamorphosis of the Hunchaks as part of the ideological current sweeping the Russian Empire and Europe. What gaps the volume fills? First of all, the volume fills three major gaps that exist within the historiography of the Hunchakian party. I don't claim that it fills all the gaps because that would be a difficult tax. But given the articles that I have, I realize that it does fill three different gaps. The assessment of the history of the uh, Hunchaks and its relation to other revolutionary movement, first. Second, writing the history of the party from a regional perspective that we do not have. Regional, I mean specifically dealing with the provinces in which they were active. Third, analysis of the ideology of the party in the larger national, regional, and global context. Again, Armenian historiography usually approaches these parties just giving them in a, putting them in a vacuum and not necessarily showing and demonstrating how they were influenced by non-Armenian, non-Armenians, by Russians, by Europeans, by socialism, biological materialism, positivism, many other ideological currents that existed in Europe or Russia. And the articles in this volume helps us better understand the history of the party, not only from an Armenian perspective, but also from Ottoman, Middle Eastern, Russian, Caucasian, and European ones. So here's the difficult task of an editor. If you have a bunch of articles, 12 articles, you have to make a sense of it. You have to divide it into different sections. So what I did I divided the volume into three sections depending on the inclination of the article or what the article is trying to say. The first section is from inception to the First Republic of Armenia, 1918-1920. Second section is about regional and local histories, both within the Ottoman Empire and outside the Ottoman Empire. And last is the ideology of the, uh, of the uh, Social Democrat and Czechian Party because we don't have a serious study about what really happening within the ideology of the paradoxes that existed within the Hunchaks and the how they viewed the world, what was the, their worldview about different events happening at the time around the globe. The section one has three articles. First article is by Abel Manukian, who demonstrates that 
the real the real date or the year of the foundation of the party is not 1890 it's not 1887 it should be 1886 because he says prior to the hunchak there existed something that was called revolutionary society in I think. Second, one is by Garabed Momjan. Rest in peace. He passed away without seeing the result of his article. The Nchagyan Nate to the Young Turk Overture, Overtures, 1895-1908. Here, Momjan discusses in detail the correspondences, the connections, the relationship between the Hunchaks and the Young Turks. And it shows that from the beginning, the Hunchaks were very conservative and very cautious about doing any job or any work or coming to any agreement with the Young Turks because they thought that the Young Turks were nationalists from the beginning and that the future of the empire would be bleak. Number three is a newly discovered letter of Sabah Gulyan to Paramas. This is a fantastic article because it doesn't only discusses the relations of the Hunchaks with the Ottoman opposition, would be it the Arab opposition, the Ottoman opposition, the uh, Albanian opposition, or even the uh, Hurriyet and Etilaf, the Liberty Party that emerged in 1911, but also discusses, analyzes a letter that was sent by Sabah Gulyan to Paramas. And at the time, most of the Armenian activists were all of the Armenians, so or, or most of the Armenian activists were, some of the Armenian activists escaped to Cairo. And this letter provides us a detailed account the way in which Artur Yassian comes into Cairo in order to track down Armenians. He was working as a spy for the Young Turks. And how Young Turks spies came to Cairo in order not only assassinate Armenian activists there, but also. Uh, opposition, Ottoman opposition figures, and also toppled down the Egyptian Khedevi system, Khedevi family. And last but not least is Professor Richard Owanisian's last article that was published about Social Democrat and Czechian Party and the First Republic of Armenia. Uh, in it, he shows that despite the fact that the Hunchaks did not play a dominant role, they were sympathetic to the cause of the First Republic and always tried to protect it against any criticism. Of course, we know that after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and after Soviet Armenia, unlike the ARF, the Hunchaks now thought that this is what it is. We have to be loyal to the uh, Soviet Republic of Armenia because this is the last thing that we have and we should uh, take care of it, despite the fact that they were anti Bolshevik. The second are regional histories. This is, I think, the one of the richest sections of the volume here we have different articles by young authors who are able to combine both Ottoman archives, Armenian sources, European sources, in order to make sense of the history of the Hunchaks and their activities in the region. The first one, Armenians, Muslims, and Citizens. Hunchaks, Pamphleteering in Central Anatolia by Tol Toygun Altentaj. In the article, it discusses this fascinating, uh, fascinating piece of history, the way in which the Hunchaks did not only appeal to Armenians, but they appealed also to Muslims, saying that we have a common cause here, which is fighting against oppression, against double taxation, against uh, authoritarianship. They used the pamphleteering as a way of mobilization. These pamphlets were written in three languages, Armeno-Turkish, <laughs> Ottoman, and Armenian. And also it shows that not everything is about violence, the way in which the government is trying to demonstrate that revolutions are involved in violence, but they try to use different types of pamphleteering. And he brings also cases, uh, examples from India, for example, where a pamphleteering was an important event in the political mobilization, political activism. Barak Ketemanian's article is entitled Pastoralist Peasants and Revolutionaries deals with the way in which the Hamini regime plays the divide and conquer game by uh, inciting Kurds against Armenians. And the way in which the Hunchaks now come see a conflict taking place and they put a political clout on it. All right. So that kind of politicization of an existing conflict, which might not be a political conflict, which might which be it can be a land dispute, uh, agrarian problem. The agrarian question was huge in the end of the 19th century. Then Umid Kurt discusses the Armenian revolutionary 
Hunchagan Revolution Party in Antep. As I said, uh, the Hunchaks were extremely influential in Cilicia, and Antep was an important center for the, the party, the way in which they mobilized students, professors, and were extremely active during the war. They tried to put the defense, didn't work. But then even after the war, when Armenians were, some of the Armenians were allowed to re return back to their homes, they played an important role as refugees. Bahram Shemesian's article, The Social Democratic and Jagan Party, Revolutionary Episode in Armenian Musada, it, it is a fascinating story of the way in which now Hunchaks come to Musada. Their aim is to go to Zaytun in order to implement their theories that they have in mind of starting kind of a revolution of uh, of saving Armenians and other groups. And uh, as a result of this revolution, they're going to implement socialism and other things. But they end up, they, they end up in Musada. And they now bring their political ideologies to Musada, uh, and they start acting in Musada. Um, uh, the uh, and one important thing is that here we see also in Musada that the Hunchaks are entering into contacts with the Alawites and saying that you know if you cooperate with us, we can form a certain autonomy which would be for you Alawites and for us Armenians. So again, these are very intricate details, minute details that we don't see in the historiography and usually misses the thing. The last but not least is Varta Matiosan article, The Hunchaks in South America, Early History. And of course, many Cilicians immigrated or forced to immigrate to Latin America. And this is the only article that discusses the diasporic politics uh, happening after the genocide. Of course, this article can be applied to many other communities around the globe in the post-genocide period, but here he concentrates on Uruguay, Brazil, and uh, Argentina. And he shows how the Hunchaks, the Dashnaks, the AGBU, and many other, many other groups at the beginning started to form. They cooperated. They fought. There was contention, cooperation. They used me different mediums in order to mobilize, in order to uh, make use of their uh, constituents. They had Armenian radio at the time, newspapers, which do not exist necessarily at the beginning. So in one word, Henshaks also played an important role at the time. They, they brought their own histories of ideological contentions to Latin America, which is a different total alien society to what's happening in the old world. The last section is about ideology. Here we have first Gerard Libaridian's uh, article called Ideology and Reality, Hunchagian Paradox Paradoxes at Birth. And he has he, he concentrates on three paradoxes. The East-West Armenian division, the church, the church, and Marxism. Because if you think about the church, now these political parties become want to become the source of legitimacy of their own societies. Some church figures participate in them with them, but the majority are very worried, including the Armenian bourgeoisie. They're very worried about the activities of the Revolutionary Party because from their perspective, from the church and the bourgeoisie, any Armenian revolutionary activity is going to destabilize the fine maintained, fine-tuned status quo that exists in the region. And we don't need different source of legitimacy that might endanger the safety of our group. The second article guides Minasian, who is a political scientist. The title makes gives the hint of the article: fraternal twins or sem semi-identical twins. He shows he shows how even. Armenian Revolution Federation and the Hunchaks had a lot of commonalities at the beginning, and then the rift happens. He discusses, goes into detail, analysis of the ideologies. He even starts with uh, one of the founders of the Armenian Revolution Federation who goes to a building. I don't know, but if you have the book, I, 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 he mentions the name Simon Zavarian, or uh, I don't know, one of them goes to a building in order to attend the meeting of Hunchaks 
and by mistake, instead of going to the third floor, he goes to the second floor where there was the Armenian Revolution meeting. And ended up becoming one of the leaders. You know, just fascinating stories. What? Simon Vratian? Okay, sorry, Simon Vratian. <laughs> Uh, the third article is by Yashar Tolka Jora. It's extremely important. It, it bases on the guides newspaper periodical, which belonged to the Armenian, uh, Arme to the student, Social Democrat and Chagan Student Union in Istanbul, in Bolis. And the way in which they wrote articles, sophisticated articles about Marxism, about global issues. And these are just university or students who have such a sophisticated understanding of global uh, ideology, political ideology, that they use the argues neologism in order to convey their uh, uh, their ideas. And the last article by Kadir Akin. Kadir Akin is a political activist, he's a politician too, and he is the uh, director of a, of a, of a documentary about the Hunchucks called Red. I think it's going to be screened next week in Pasadena. He wrote a book. He wrote, he wrote a book on Paramas, which was recently translated into English by Massis Publishing, and his article in the footsteps of hidden history: the roots of socialism in the Ottoman Empire. In this fantastic article, Akin says that until now, Armenians, Turkish left, denies Armenian presence. Not necessarily Armenian genocide, but contribution of Armenians to socialism in the Ottoman Empire. For Turkish left, socialism starts with Hussein Helmi in 1913, who is a socialist, and uh, he even makes fun of him that he wrote a letter to Karl Marx, but never received an answer, because Karl Marx was dead decades ago. And it shows how there has been really ignorance about socialism and demonstrates that socialism began with Armenians and other groups. Hunchucks were purely dedicated to socialism from all the Armenian groups and makes a case here that there is the denial is also poor from the perspective that many of these figures ended up becoming part of the Turkish Communist Party. Many of the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide came part members of the Turkish Communist Party and hence deny acceptance acceptance and recognition of Armenian contribution to socialism means that you have to revise your history and open the Pandora's box whereby you show who from your heroes of socialist heroes have been implicated in the Armenian genocide. Thank you. So I forgot to mention uh, for the for the folks online. I think everybody knows how uh, Zoom works by now. But nevertheless, uh, please use your, the Zoom Q and A to submit your questions. And for the folks in the room, if you have a question or a comment, please come up to the microphone so that the people online can can hear you as well. I've been waiting twenty six years for someone to give a talk on on the Hunchaks. Uh, it, it hasn't happened in all the years that I've been working here, uh, and I'm not sure if it's ever happened in, in the, uh, you know, almost 70 years of, of this organization. It, so to say this is overdue would be an understatement. I sent you an email 2001, <laughs> that you never answered that. In <laughs> well, you know how it is. Um, so my question is... Is this your question? My question is this. Can you, it's a leading question, but can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges and difficulties of writing the history of the Hunchaks, given the state of the sources. Yeah. I think the main difficulty is that the Hunchaks archives are not concentrated in one place, though the Hunchakian part today is working on digitization, work is being done in Armenia and other places. But unlike the Armenian Revolution Federation archives, which is housed here in, in uh, Watertown, Ironic Building, which is a treasure trove for anyone who wants to do research about Armenian political activism in the Ottoman Empire, we don't have that for the Hanshagyan party. So it becomes difficult, bits and pieces from here, but they're now ramping up and trying to uh, uh, digitize. There's a major project going on, the digitization of archives, but also remember that 
the uh, party was also kind of received the blow by the uh, by the killing of its most important political members, the twenty who were put on gallows, and so a lot of material has have been destroyed. So what we have here today: archives, memoirs, newspapers, and letters. But there is apparently a lot of archives that are being collected now by the uh, uh, California uh, Hunchuk uh, Party in order to make them available for the party. Good. Um, another question is, and I know this is maybe outside the scope of, of what's covered in the book, but the Hunchaks and then the, the Reformed Hunchaks were extremely active and present here in the U.S. and certainly in, in, in the Northeast and probably in Maybe in Fresno, I'm not sure. And I mean, in the eight, as early as the early 1890s, uh, do you know of any work that's being done on that front? No, actually, and that's one of the problems. Is that you know, I wish one day we'll have a volume about Armenian. I mean, there is the Armenian uh, political parties in Armenia. The book by uh, uh, what's his name? You gave me the book once. The, uh, in Armenian, it's the Armenian political parties in the United States. It's an Armenian book. Yes. Uh, it should come to you, the name. It's green. It's green. Yeah, it is green, <laughs> of course. It's green. I forgot the name, but uh, it's an important book. But also we need, similar to what Vartan Matiosan did in the case of Uruguay, Brazil, and Argentina, we need an assessment of all the Armenian activities of the Ar all the Armenian political parties because these political parties actually were important in revamping and re uh, uh, bringing life and spirit to the Armenian uh, uh, diaspora that began from the ashes of the Armenian genocide. So they played an important role in helping, aiding, educating, providing help, aid, education to their constituents, to their uh, to the Armenians in general. Of course, there were a lot of Armenian. Uh, political uh, groups, including the Hunchaks here in different parts, but we need study the history. And unfortunately, we don't have a single book in English that discusses the uh, political activism, not only of the Hunchaks, but uh, Dashnaks or Ramgavars in the United States. And that's that's overdue now. Now, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, might Ben Alexander's book might discuss a bit about that, which just came up, uh, Ar Ar America, Ararad in America. Yes, which was published with my series with IB Taurus Press. It's available downstairs, actually, in the bookshelf in the and, bookstore. Yes. And of course, in the earlier period, there's some information in in, in Myrat, Robert Myrat's. Book. Yes, yeah. But a, a whole book, such as you describe, would be most helpful. From online, from Yelena Ambartsumian, can you please discuss key women leaders and participants? of the Hunchak party. Yeah, of course. I mean, one of the most uh, important figure is Maro Vardanyan, and she is a, a power to be reckoned with. As I said, she is an important, she was an important member of the Russian secret organization. And it's it's amazing that uh, these Armenians are, or I don't know if they're Armenians also, because you have also hybrid identities. They're influenced by culture, by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, political ideology, but they were also involved, and that's where they also got trained and get, had the knowledge of political activism. And Maro Vartanian today, I mean, uh, I think the Hunchaks are working on, on publishing her diaries, which haven't been seen the day of light. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be fascinating as the first Armenian women revolutionary you know, who, uh, who was there. I mean, if you see the 10... You know, the Armenian Revolution Federation, we always think about Christopher Rostov Zavarian, the trilogy, but there were actually 10, but none of them was a woman. And here you have Maro Vartanian, who is uh, Nazar Begian's fiancé, extremely very important political activist, writer, and, you know, uh, and uh, ideologue. And uh, uh, we don't have other Armenian parties as such. So that's important, yes. Also from online, and of course, if people in the room would like to ask a question, you can, why don't you come right on up and then I'll get back to the online. Joe. Uh, when, the, when the Hunchagans decided to go underground, that is, become illegal, um, how did they envision the uh, Young Turks would be overthrown? In, in other words, how did, they, how did they envision that they would accomplish their goal? Very good, very good question. Uh, of course, the one important thing that we have to remember that the Hunchaks were not acting alone. The Hunchaks were acting with the Ottoman opposition, 
groups and the Ottoman opposition, they were hoping that one day they'll get rid of the CUP and not bring the Ottoman Empire into war. So that's important to mention because they were in contact with the different, the uh, uh, Hurriyet and Etilaf parties, uh, the uh, Liberty Party, the Ottoman opposition party. And so they're acting together in order to find a way to bring down the CUP. And of course, uh, DRF at the beginning cooperates with the Young Turks, but in 1911, they uh, they uh, decease any cooperation with them because the promises were not fulfilled. And th there were two promises that were given to the ARF that we're going to return the lands that were confiscated during Abdel Hamid II. And the second one is to provide security for Armenians in the eastern provinces. And nothing of that sort had happened. Uh, from online, from Michael Cholden, can you please speak on any interplay between the Hunchaks and the Armenian Social Democratic Workers Association, the specifists led by David Ananul? Uh, I've heard about the specifists, but I, I've heard about the socialists also. It wasn't only Armenian. We have to think about uh, the fact that the, it wasn't only the Social Democrat and Chakan Party. There were other socialist groups and parties, workers, socialist workers, unions, etc. Armenians, but I'm not that aware of. I'm not, I can't provide an answer on the specific, specific. Not a specific answer. Yeah. Uh, yes, and thank you from Uri Y online. Uh, online. It was Manuk Cismajet, who was the author of the uh, book that we were oh, yes. about before and couldn't remember the name of. Thank you. Uh, from Sebu Aslanyan, some European political parties in the 19th and early 20th century were mass political parties with a wide base of followers or members. Do we know and can we know how many active members of the uh, SDHP uh, there there were? Were there card-carrying members, et cetera? Uh, that's a very difficult question, uh, Sebo, to answer because we don't have the data. And because most of these members were acting in a clan clandestine matter underground, uh, it was de very difficult, but they had presence in all parts of the Ottoman Empire. And as a matter of fact, it would be easier to find their followers after the 1908 revolution, whereby these parties became legal parties. But in numbers, it would be difficult. It might be, I don't know if they had the system of card carrying members like the uh, ARF does, uh, Dashnaks do. So it might be difficult to find out. But uh, again, Silesia was their important center. They had large uh, large, uh, you know, followers in Silesia. I'm not talking about thousands or maybe even hundreds. You know, activists. Silesia was an important place where they were able to put the basis of their activities, and uh, not Vaughan, not Sivas, but Silesia. And uh, again, you know, they were very pessimist about anything that was happening in the Ottoman Empire, and uh, so. This is building on the question about Maro, Maro Vardanyan. Um, how does Hunchak socialism intersect with feminism at that time? Well, uh, or does it? Yeah. I don't have any information about what socialism, what Hunchaks believed in socialism, uh, what Hunchaks believed in feminism, uh, because what I've read so far, it's only about pure socialism. And there wasn't any mention, maybe, maybe Maro Vartanian had mentioned in her writings, but I didn't see any feminist feminist approach. Maybe Uri Berberian can uh, uh, chip in and provide more information. She worked on revolutionary groups at the time. So I haven't found out anything about feminism, but I know that there were feminist women writers in the 19th century, end of 19th century. As a matter of fact, Hasmi Khalapian's book is uh, coming up soon that deals with uh, Armenian women in the late Ottoman Empire, issues dealing with feminism. It, it's coming up also from the series, Ibi Torah series, uh, in, with uh, Armenians in the early modern and modern world. Modern Very busy world. series. Very yeah. good. Yes, David. <laughs> am, am I correct that the Masis Weekly is a publication of... Yes. So the Hanjags have kind of gone mainstream with this Armenian... Uh, uh, ACA, I think it's called. Do you know about that? What's ACA? Wait, it's a it's a lobbying group. It's like the assembly. Oh, Armenian National Council or Armenian it, Committee of America. Yeah, yeah, that's it. They they've gone mainstream. They've gone mainstream with a newsletter, and I don't think people. You know, I don't think people knew that the Hunchucks 
are behind it, which is okay. But I, I, this, they're sort of, they're sort of sneaking in there and trying to be like the assembly. And I'm a National Committee of America. It's okay. I'm just pointing it out. Yeah, I mean, I think it's legitimate to have a lobbying group. Every party having lobbying. I don't see anything illegal in that. <laughs> uh, from uh, Alan Whitehorn, a uh, wonderful presentation, an important book addressing significant gap. Can we suggest that nationalism and socialis socialism need not be incompatible in that early revolutionary nationalism was opposed to imperialist inequality and socialism was opposed to capitalist inequality? But these parties weren't anti-imperialist. I mean, if they were anti-imperialist, they wouldn't ask for the help of the European empires in order to uh, improve their lot. They were anti-Ottoman imperialism, but they weren't anti-European imperialism. They were nationalist parties at the end of the day. Uh, some, as I said, believed in socialism as the way to go, as a political uh, thing, but again, as Libarian also mentions in his article, paradox exists between socialism and nationalism, you know? Can you just briefly touch on, obviously there's not much in the English language uh, till this book. Can you briefly talk about what's what kind of scholarship there is that exists in Armenian or other languages? Of course, there is a uh, most important source, I would say, is Arsen Gidur's book, the History of the Social Democratic Hinchagian Party, two volumes. Arsene Gidur was an important member of the, Hinchaks, of the Hinchak Party during the Republic period. He was sent as the delegation of the Armenian Republic in 1918 to take care of the refugees in Iraq. As a matter of fact, my wife's family were sent as refugees from Van to Iraq. And uh, and uh, so that was his task as a delegation. He became an important figure. Another, I mean, besides the newspapers, there are also important memoirs, such as those, or writings such as those of, uh, uh, there are a lot of Hunchagian writings, but the most prominent of them is Sabah Gurian, who really uh, is considered, Sabah Gurian is considered as the ideologue of the Social Democratic Hunchagian Party. Yes, um, can, can you comment on um, uh, Hunchakyan documentation, which uh, may be in Turkish archives mm. and uh, which uh, probably is in the ARF archives as well? Very good point. I mean, uh, as I said, the, the second section of the book discusses regional histories of the different, some of the regions, Central Anatolia, uh, Musadar, uh, 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 Sasun and many other places, and most of the histories are based on Ottoman archives. Of course, if you check the Ottoman archives, Hinchaks are the villains, of course, always, because they're the komitajis and they're the bad guys from the perspective of the Ottoman government. So I don't think you're going to see anything nice about Hinchaks in the Ottoman archives, but you can read against the grain. And that's another technique of bringing documents that discuss about the Hinchaks, and you can extrapolate or you can really deduce what you want to deduce from these documents, reading against the brain based on the, let's say, perpetrator's archives. And, uh, you know, it's fascinating. Also a topic that is taboo within Armenian history is the Armenian collaborators. You know, without Artur Yasyan, 20 people wouldn't have been put on gallows, you know. And there are a lot of, Arme not a lot of, but a list of Armenians who collaborated during World War I by giving the names of Armenian activists and political activists, telling them where they were hiding. So there is a collaboration. I mean, this is not something endemic to Armenians. All genocides have collaborators of the victim group with the perpetrator. So that's important. The other part was about possible material in the ARF archives. Of course. I mean, I, I have done work at the ARF archive for the Adana project, but I haven't done work on examining the uh, ARF, Hunchak relations, that's extremely important, I think, and I think there are and should be important material there in the archives. So. Harry. Thank you very much, Pedros, for excellent presentation. I was just wondering if you could tell us about the status of the Hunchak party in the United States, in Armenia, and worldwide today. The current state. Yeah, yeah of course, uh, 
Hanchakian party still exists. They're uh, in the United States. They have the Western region. Uh, they don't have Eastern region. I think I might be mistaken, but their Western region is in uh, in California, uh, centered in Pasadena. There's the Masis uh, Publishing House. Uh, there are large auditorium there, and their activities are very active party there. Uh, they're very active. They're active in Armenia too. Now they moved to Armenia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and they have. Uh, they have party representation. They're not in the parliament, but they also uh, have representation, a parliament representation also in Lebanon. The Homen Men and the Social Democratic Czechian Party is also active in, in Lebanon. So that's important, but it, it, it's not as what it used to be in the past. And I think part of it also is the result of the rift that happened at the beginning, which weakened the party. The rift between Hunchak Vera Gazmian Hunchak, Reform Hunchaks, and the regular Hunchaks. And so, so these are, yeah, and they weakened the party. But after the Armenian genocide, they were active at the beginning, but then they started declining. So that's important. America, yeah. Yes, I think they have, yes, the representation in South America, Australia too. They have a, a, a representation in Australia and other some other European countries. Can, can you just briefly? Touch on how what what what, what happened to the Veragazmi Alpanchaks, the reformed Hunchaks? I don't think they exist anymore, if I'm not mistaken. No, I think after World War One, they 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 collapsed or they were diminished. So, well, all right then. Uh, nope, there's one more question. Uh, in 1907, reformed Hunchaks assassinated an Armenian American because he had refused to contribute to the cause. This is something that has been written about. Yes. How do contemporary Hunchaks today address this part of their history? I'm guessing they don't, but nevertheless, I'll let you answer. No, I mean, it's not about the Hunchaks only. The RF also assassinated members of bourgeoisie. And it was, uh, I mean, there's no justification of killing anyone, but that was the, you know, it was, there's a book actually uh, about how many Armenians were killed by Armenia, how many Armenians were killed by political parties, you yeah. know. Uh, it was the modus operandi of different parties, you know. Uh, it's either you are a collaborator with the government, you'll be assassinated, or you're not giving money to the party. So it also put the Armenian bourgeoisie in a, in a difficult situation. Uh, on the one hand, if they co cooperate with the party, they would be imprisoned and under the, you know, become a prisoner or be, be, they will be tortured or imprisoned by the Hamidian regime. On the other hand, if they don't, they might be assassinated. So... It also created kind of a legitimacy crisis, a, cri a crisis within the Armenian society. So that's important. Well, obviously, a book like this is not uh, meant to be the end of the story, but of just, course, this just is to the, open things up, right? Yeah, we. I mean, we have just touched the surface. I can say so. There's a lot of work needs to be done. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mark Fred Nasser, for inviting. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to the online audience as well. And we always welcome your thoughts and feedback. You can email us at hq at nasser.org. And I'll repeat again that uh, if you're online or here uh, and you want to purchase a copy of the book, which we don't yet have, uh, contact Lori Ardumian, Laura at nasser.org today, and you can get it for the uh, sale price of 25% off as soon as they arrive, which the way things are going will probably be tomorrow morning. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Good night. Thank you very much.